Access your free language gifts of the month right now. Here's what you're getting this month. First, the Life Events Conversation Cheat Sheet. If you're a language learner, then this is the most important resource you can have. You'll learn to talk about your life and major life events, birth, graduation, getting a job, marriage, and much more in your target language. Second, all the words and phrases you must know about food. Learn the most common words and phrases for fruits, drinks, flavors, cooking, and more with this new PDF. Download it now for free. Third, 20 must-know small talk phrases. With this bonus, you'll be able to have small talk in your target language. You'll learn phrases like, how are things? I haven't seen you in ages, and much more. Fourth, do you know how to say summer in your target language? If you don't, you'll want this essential summer vocabulary bonus. This one minute lesson is perfect for beginners. Fifth, how to say you dislike something. With this next bonus, you'll learn useful phrases like, I don't like this idea, I hate this, and much more. Sixth, free audiobooks. Unlock our huge library of language learning audiobooks. Save them to any device and listen and learn. They're yours to keep forever. And finally, the deal of the month. If you want to finally master a language with lessons by real teachers and our complete language learning program, get 35% off Premium or Premium Plus with the Power Up sale. To get your gifts and language learning resources, click the link in the lesson description below. Download them right now before they expire. Hand. 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 So your hand, it's a part of your body. This part of your body is your hand. Left hand, left hand, left hand, arm, arm, arm. So the arm is this part of your body from here to the end of your hand. Muscular arm, muscular arm, muscular arm. Foot, foot, foot. So your foot, just one, is the part of your body that's at the very, very bottom. Right foot, right foot, right foot. Leg, leg, leg. So your leg is the entire long part of your body, one leg that you walk on. Long legs, long legs, long legs. Finger, finger, finger. So your fingers are these parts of your body. So finger is a countable noun. We count it one finger, two finger, three fingers, and so on. Pinky finger. Pinky finger. Pinky finger. Back. 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 So your back is like the reverse part of your body. We think of this as the front part. Our back is behind us. My back hurts. My back hurts. My back hurts. Stomach. 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 So your stomach is the part of your body that digests food. So we often talk about our stomach because it feels uncomfortable. My stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. My stomach hurts. Chest. 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 So your chest is the upper part of the front of your body. I have chest pains. I have chest pains. I have chest pains. January. 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 January is the first month of the year. In North America, it is typically a cold month. It's very cold here in January. It's very cold here in January. It's very cold here in January. 
February. 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 So February has an interesting spelling. That first R isn't really pronounced. February is the shortest month with 28 days. February is the shortest month with 28 days. February is the shortest month with 28 days. March. 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 March is the third month of the year. We think of March as the time when spring begins. It is now April, so last month was March. It is now April, so last month was March. It is now April, so last month was March. April. 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 April is the fourth month of the year, and we think of this as a time when flowers start to bloom. April showers bring May flowers. April showers bring May flowers. April showers bring May flowers. May. 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 May is the fifth month of the year. We think of May as just the time before summer. So the weather is typically really, really nice and spring is in full, like, bloom. May 31st is World No Smoking Day. May 31st is World No Smoking Day. May 31st is World No Smoking Day. June. 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 June is the sixth month of the year. It feels a little bit warmer than May, but it's not quite summer. A warm June. A warm June. A warm June. July. 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 So July, the seventh month of the year, is typically when many people think of summer as beginning in the U.S. July is one of seven months with 31 days. July is one of seven months with 31 days. July is one of seven months with 31 days. August. 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 August, the eighth month of the year, tends to be quite hot, and there's a lot of fun summer activities to do. The school is closed in August. The school is closed in August. The school is closed in August. September. 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 September is kind of the beginning of fall or autumn, and it's also typically the time of year when students go back to school. Today is Saturday, September 10th. Today is Saturday, September 10th. Today is Saturday, September 10th. October. 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 So October is when the weather gets a little bit cooler and we start to see some popular autumn foods appearing. Halloween falls on October 31st. Halloween falls on October 31st. Halloween falls on October 31st. November. 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 So November is very well known in the U.S. for having Thanksgiving when we enjoy a huge meal with family or friends. November is one of four months with 30 days. November is one of four months with 30 days. November is one of four months with 30 days. December. 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 December is the last month of the year, and we think of it as a time for celebration. December 31st is New Year's Eve. December 31st is New Year's Eve. December 31st is New Year's Eve. 
watch, watch, watch. So when we use watch to talk about a noun, it's referring to the clock you can wear on your wrist. Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Do you have a watch? Glasses. 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 So glasses are eyewear. We wear glasses so that we can see better or so that we can block the sun from our eyes. I don't wear glasses. I don't wear glasses. I don't wear glasses. Jacket. 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 So a jacket is usually a light piece of clothing.、Uh, it keeps you a little bit warmer in autumn or maybe in spring. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. That jacket looks nice on you. Receive. 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 So to receive something means to get something. Get sounds a little bit more casual than receive. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. To receive a confession of love. Search. 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 So the word search means to look for. To look for something. Search tends to sound a little bit more formal than look for. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It'll show up if you search on the internet. It will show up if you search on the internet. Take. 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 So take means to remove something from another place or to choose something. Please take me home. Please take me home. Please take me home. Week. 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 So this word is the opposite of the word strong. It means something that doesn't have a lot of power. A weak team. A weak team. A weak team. Strong. 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 So strong is the opposite of weak. Strong refers to something that has lots and lots of power. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Be strong and don't give up. Cold. 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 So the word cold typically refers to temperature. When the temperature is low, we describe the feeling as cold. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. The North Pole is cold even in summer. Hot. 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 So hot is the opposite of cold. Hot is used when the temperatures are warm. The temperatures are very, very high. We describe the feeling with hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. The tea is still hot. Funny. 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 So the word funny refers to something that causes us to laugh. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Funny sitcoms make me happy. Peach. 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 So a peach is a well-known fruit. It's kind of sweet. I'm allergic to peaches. I'm allergic to peaches. I am allergic to peaches. Orange. 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 
So orange can refer to the fruit, or it can refer to the color orange. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. I drink orange juice in the morning. Potato. 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 So a potato is a very, very popular food. We make all kinds of things with potatoes: French fries, mashed potatoes, and so on. Fried potato is not good for your health. Fried potato is not good for your health. Fried potato is not good for your health. Soybean. 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 So a soybean is an ingredient that people may use to create other things, like milk, for example. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Soybeans grow inside the pods. Vegetable. 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 So a vegetable is a food that's good for you. So there are many different kinds of vegetables: carrots, zucchinis, so on. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. I ate fried vegetables. Cow. 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 So a cow is a farm animal. We use cows for dairy and for milk and for beef. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. The cows are grazing in the field. Pig. 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 A pig is another farm animal, usually very low to the ground and pink or kind of gray in color. We use these for meat. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Pigs are intelligent animals. Horse. 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 So a horse, another farm animal, is used a lot more for entertainment, for like racing activities. Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Have you ever ridden a horse before? Snow. 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 So snow is a type of weather. It's precipitation, so that means it's rain. It's water from the sky, but that is frozen. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There's a lot of snow on the mountain. There is a lot of snow on the mountain. Shirt. 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 So a shirt is a piece of clothing that we wear on the top part of our body. There are ten shirts in the closet. There are ten shirts in the closet. There are ten shirts in the closet. Pants. 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 So pants, that's a piece of clothing that we wear on the lower part of our body. It covers our legs. Your pants are bigger than mine. Your pants are bigger than mine. Your pants are bigger than mine. Dress. 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 So a dress is something that's worn over the entire body. It usually covers from the shoulders to around the knee area, but it can go further. I regret not buying that dress. I regret not buying that dress. I regret not buying that dress. Say. 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 We use say for simple reports of speech. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. I was just going to say that. Call. 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 We use the verb call when we want to make a phone call to someone. 
Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Please give me a call tomorrow morning. Find. 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 We use the word find when we talk about the moment we discover something. How did you find the cell phone? How did you find the cell phone? How did you find the cell phone? Clean. 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 So the word clean can be used as an adjective or it can be used as a verb. It refers to making something nice. We aim for a clean environment. We aim for a clean environment. We aim for a clean environment. Dirty. 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 So the word dirty is used to refer to something that is not clean. The fork is on the dirty plate. The fork is on the dirty plate. The fork is on the dirty plate. Carrot. 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 So a carrot is a very common vegetable. It's orange, maybe about this size. We can have small ones as well. Kids do not like carrots. Kids do not like carrots. Kids do not like carrots. Onion. 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 So an onion is a very common cooking ingredient. When you cut them, it will make you cry. I don't cry when I cut onions. I don't cry when I cut onions. I don't cry when I cut onions. Lettuce. 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 So lettuce is very commonly used in salads. It's a leafy green vegetable. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. My salad only has lettuce and tomato. Sheep. 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 So a sheep is a kind of farm animal. We get lots of things from them, such as milk and wool as well. The sheep is eating the green grass. The sheep is eating the green grass. The sheep is eating the green grass. Rabbit. 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 So a rabbit is a very small, cute animal uh, that's known for hopping around. Your rabbit is very cute. Your rabbit is very cute. Your rabbit is very cute. Seal. 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 So a seal is an ocean animal. They can be big or a little small. They kind of look like dogs sometimes in the ocean. Seals live in the coldest areas. Seals live in the coldest areas. Seals live in the coldest areas. Cloud. 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 So clouds are those usually white or gray kind of fluffy things we see in the sky. I can't see any clouds today. I can't see any clouds today. I can't see any clouds today. Sunny. 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 Sunny is the word that we use to talk about a day with lots of sunshine. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. I often go on a picnic on a sunny day. Rainy. 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 Rainy is used to talk about weather, so we use it for days when water is falling from the sky. It'll be rainy this Saturday. It'll be rainy this Saturday. It will be rainy this Saturday. Baby. Baby. 
baby. Baby is the word we use to describe a very small creature. We can use it for humans and we can use it for animals. The baby sleeps on the blanket. The baby sleeps on the blanket. The baby sleeps on the blanket. Girl. 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 So a girl is someone who is born as a female. The girl washes her face. The girl washes her face. The girl washes her face. Boy. 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 The word boy refers to someone who is born as a male. The boy fell down from the tree. The boy fell down from the tree. The boy fell down from the tree. Happy. 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 We use happy to describe our mood. We use this word when we are feeling positive. I am a happy person. I am a happy person. I am a happy person. Sad. 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 So the word sad is used to describe our feelings when we are feeling down or low. The sad teenager is sitting alone. The sad teenager is sitting alone. The sad teenager is sitting alone. Angry. 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 The word angry also refers to our emotions. We use it in times when we feel upset or very unhappy about something. There was something that made me angry this morning. There was something that made me angry this morning. There was something that made me angry this morning. Clothing. 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 Clothing is a word that's used to refer to anything we wear. This can mean coats, pants, jackets, shirts, hats, whatever. I worked at a clothing store. I worked at a clothing store. I worked at a clothing store. Shoe. 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 So a shoe is something you wear on your foot. I need new shoes. I need new shoes. I need new shoes. Sock. 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 A sock is something that you wear between your shoe and your foot, usually. You wear heavy socks often in winter. Are you wearing socks? Are you wearing socks? Are you wearing socks? Underwear. 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 So underwear refers to the clothing we wear under the clothes we can see. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. My socks and underwear are in the top drawer of my dresser. Talk. 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 We use the verb talk when we want to refer to a conversation, so two or more people are participating. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about it. Give. 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 We use the verb give when we want to provide someone with something else. Can I give you a useful tip? Can I give you a useful tip? Can I give you a useful tip? Low. 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 We use the word low to talk about something that is not high. This is the opposite of high. So it's something near the ground. This table is too low for me. This table is too low for me. 
This table is too low for me. High. 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 So the word high is the opposite of the word low. It refers to something that is far away from the ground. The waves are high today. The waves are high today. The waves are high today. Fruit. 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 So fruit refers to a category of foods. So fruits tend to be rather sweet. Please put the fruits on the plate. Please put the fruits on the plate. Please put the fruits on the plate. Octopus. 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 So an octopus is a very interesting animal with eight legs. Uh, some cultures like to eat octopus. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. The octopus is swimming in the ocean. Shark. 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 So a shark is for many people a very scary undersea creature. Some of them are huge and can eat people. The surfer was bitten by a shark. The surfer was bitten by a shark. The surfer was bitten by a shark. Whale. 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 So whales are typically very, very large creatures that live under the sea. Some are peaceful, some are aggressive. Whales are mammals. Whales are mammals. Whales are mammals. Cloudy. 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 So cloudy refers to weather. It's used on days when there are many clouds in the sky. I don't like cloudy days. I don't like cloudy days. I don't like cloudy days. Cool. 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 We use cool when the weather is not like cold, but it feels a little bit nice actually still. The weather is cool. The weather is cool. The weather is cool. Cucumber. 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 So a cucumber is a food that we can eat. It's something that's healthy and usually pretty refreshing. These cucumbers are fresh. These cucumbers are fresh. These cucumbers are fresh. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. Bell pepper. So a bell pepper is another food that many people like to eat. Sometimes they're a little bit bitter. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. The most common bell peppers are green, red, or yellow. Broccoli. 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 Broccoli is another very healthy food. Lots of kids really don't like it, though. Order the broccoli soup. Order the broccoli soup. Order the broccoli soup. Banana. 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 Bananas are a very popular fruit. They are yellow in color and you peel them to open them. This banana is really sweet. This banana is really sweet. This banana is really sweet. Apple. 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 Apples are very popular fruits. You can usually find them in red or in green colors. I'm peeling an apple. I'm peeling an apple. I'm peeling an apple. Grape. 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 So a grape is another type of fruit. You usually find them in purple or in green colors. That grape looks pretty old. 
That grape looks pretty old. That grape looks pretty old. Watermelon. 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 So a watermelon is a very large fruit. It's green on the outside and pink on the inside. She bought a huge watermelon. She bought a huge watermelon. She bought a huge watermelon. Bird. 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 So a bird is a creature that can fly through the sky. It has wings and feathers. We listen to the birds. We listen to the birds. We listened to the birds. Mouse. 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 So a mouse is a very small creature. Some people consider it a rodent, so it's not wanted. The mouse is eating grass. The mouse is eating grass. The mouse is eating grass. Sun. 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 So the sun is the star that's closest to Earth and it gives us sunshine. Today the sun is shining. Today the sun is shining. Today the sun is shining. Weather. 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 So weather just refers to the outside conditions, the conditions in nature. This weather is awful. This weather is awful. This weather is awful. Degree. 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 So the word degree is the word we use for that small circle next to Celsius or Fahrenheit when we talk about the temperature. It is one degree outside. It is one degree outside. It is one degree outside. Woman. 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 So woman refers to one person, one woman. When talking about more than one woman, we use women. The woman is wearing a black sweater. The woman is wearing a black sweater. The woman is wearing a black sweater. Man. 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 So a man refers to one male person. When we want to talk about more than one male person, we say men. The director is a very serious man. The director is a very serious man. The director is a very serious man. Girlfriend. 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 So the word girlfriend can be used to refer to your romantic partner who is a girl. We can also use it to talk about female friends. Your girlfriend is one year older than you, right? Your girlfriend is one year older than you, right? Your girlfriend is one year older than you, right? Boyfriend. 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 So the word boyfriend is used to refer to a male romantic partner. We do not typically use this word to talk about our male friends, though. She'll go to the Prince Islands with her boyfriend. She'll go to the Prince Islands with her boyfriend. She'll go to the Prince Islands with her boyfriend. Train. 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 So a train is a large kind of public transportation that we use to travel quickly inside cities and between cities. What time is the last train? What time is the last train? What time is the last train? Airplane. 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 So airplanes are the mode of transportation that fly. We often call them planes as well. The passengers flew on the airplane. The passengers flew on the airplane. The passengers flew on the airplane. 
bus, bus, bus. So a bus is like a large car. We typically use it to transport people inside cities or between cities on the road. He rides the bus. He rides the bus. He rides the bus. Taxi. 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 A taxi is a single car that you can rent, so you need to pay money to use a taxi to travel in a city. Give me a call after you get in the taxi. Give me a call after you get in the taxi. Give me a call after you get in the taxi. Spinach. 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 So spinach is a very healthy food. It's leafy and green and popular for salads. Spinach is a rich source of iron and calcium. Spinach is a rich source of iron and calcium. Spinach is a rich source of iron and calcium. Dolphin. 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 A dolphin is a very smart undersea animal, and they're very popular because they're very cute, and it sounds like they're talking to people sometimes. The dolphin jumps out of the water. The dolphin jumps out of the water. The dolphin jumps out of the water. Squid. 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 So a squid is another undersea creature. Sometimes they're small, but in other cases, in special cases, they are enormous. There are giant squid as well. I can't eat squid. I can't eat squid. I can't eat squid. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, we're going to talk about how to make questions using the future perfect tense. I'll review how to make questions with the simple, future perfect and with the progressive or the continuous version. Uh, so I'll introduce how to make it, when we use it, and a few example sentences. Let's get started. I want to begin then with a quick review of future perfect tense and when to use it. You might have seen the video about the future perfect tense or the future perfect progressive tense. This is the same as that. To review though for this lesson, we use the future perfect tense to refer to actions that will or that won't, will not, be finished at a specific time in the future. So this is very specific to the simple future perfect tense. To give a visual representation, if we're talking in our conversation in the present here now, there's some point in the future, like tomorrow or 8 p.m. or Monday, for example, so, by this point in time, something, some action will or will not be finished by this point in time. So, I've marked this with a star and a question. So, we, maybe we will, maybe we won't. Uh, we're using questions for this lesson, so I've used a question mark for this. So, this is for the simple, the simple future perfect. For progressive, however, which we'll also review quickly today, uh, for progressive, this is for actions that will be continuing at a specific point in the future. So this is one difference between the simple form and the progressive form. With the simple form, the action either will or will not be finished. With progressive form, the action will or will not be continuing. So let's take a look now at how to make future perfect questions. Let's begin with the simple version, future perfect simple questions. To make a basic future perfect simple tense question, we begin with will, then we add our subject like I, he, she, for example. We follow with have, then we use the past participle form of the verb and any additional information. This is where we include our deadline or our cutoff point. I'll share some examples of this in just a second. If, however, we want to make a future perfect progressive question, we can use a very similar pattern. We begin again with will plus subject plus have, 
But to make the progressive form, we need to use have been, and instead of the past participle form of the verb, we use the progressive or the continuous form of the verb, the ing form of a verb. As we did with the simple future tense, simple future perfect rather, we then include any additional information. This is where we include our deadline or our cutoff point, our future reference point. That comes at the end of the sentence, the end of the question. If you want to make a negative, we simply replace won't for will. So instead of using will at the beginning of the sentence, we use won't. This tends to be used when we're confirming something. I'll show you an example of this at the end of the lesson, but we use this won't when we're asking about something we thought was true and we want to confirm that with another person. It's kind of a specific case. So I'll, again, I'll show you an example. For now though, let's practice making a few basic sentences with these patterns. All right, over here, I want to use the verb finish for this sentence. Will he have something, his report by Monday? So we see that Monday is our future point here. We also see we have will he have. There's no been here. This tells us that it is a future perfect simple tense sentence. So we need to use the past participle form of the verb. Will he have finished? His report by Monday means by this point in time in the future, Monday, will the report be finished? Will it not be finished? That's the question. So we'll say either yes, his report will be finished by Monday, or no, his report will not be finished by Monday. So will he have finished his report by Monday? He will have or he won't have. Okay, let's move along. Will you have something by 8 p.m.? By 8 p.m. So the verb I want to use here is eat. Again, we have will you have. There's no been here. So that's a good hint that we should use the past participle form of the verb eat. So the past participle form of eat is eaten. Will you have eaten by 8 p.m.? So perhaps this is a dinner invitation, for example. Will you have eaten by 8 p.m.? The answer to this might be, no, we won't have eaten, or no, I won't have eaten because I'm working, or yes, I'll have eaten already, for example. So we can use the future perfect tense to reply to this question as well. Yes, I will have eaten. No, I won't have eaten yet, for example. You can mix yet and already into your answers. Okay. Let's continue along to the next example. Will we have been something on this project for a month as of tomorrow? So here we do see been. Will we have been? This is a big hint that we should use the progressive or the continuous form of the verb. Our verb here is work. So the progressive form is working. Will we have been working? on this project for a month. As of tomorrow, as of tomorrow means tomorrow is kind of our like landmark point. So at this point in time, at this specific point in time, tomorrow, will we have been continuously working on this project for a one month period? So in other words, we began working on the project one month ago, one month in the past. We've been working continuously and we're still working on the project. So this is a confirmation question. Will we have been working on this project for a month as of tomorrow? You could say, yes, we will have been working for a month. Or no, we won't have been working for a month yet. Something like that could be the reply. So this is probably a confirmation question about how long a project has been in progress. I want to finish though with an example of this won't that I mentioned earlier. I made a conversation actually. So let's take a look. A says, let's meet at 6 p.m. Let's imagine it's an office. Let's meet at 6 p.m. B says, won't you have left the office by then? You have a dinner meeting. A says, oh, right. So this is a very common example of when we might use this won't pattern. 
So like I said, it's used to confirm. A perhaps forgets his or her schedule and therefore suggests a six o'clock meeting. Let's meet at 6 p.m. B, however, remembers the schedule and B asks this question to confirm the future plan. Well, won't you have left the office by 6 p.m.? So at this point in time, you will be gone. So you will have left the office at some point before this, right? Using this, won't you, sounds like it's a confirmation. Isn't that right? Because you have a dinner meeting. A then remembers, oh, right. So this is a very common way we might use this, but as you can see, it's kind of a specific situation where some person forgets a future schedule or a future planned action. Another person in the situation remembers it though, and they ask to confirm. So you might see it used in something like this. However, we tend to use this more in the positive, to ask positive questions about the future, about future activities. So I hope that that helps you make questions with the future perfect tense and with the future perfect progressive tense, not just simple. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or want to practice making some sentences, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Of course, too, if you liked the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you as you study English. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and we will see you again soon. Bye-bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about asking permission using may I and can I. Let's get started. First, many people ask, what is the difference between may I and can I? The simple answer is when asking for permission, you want to do something, you ask to do that thing. When asking for permission, in modern American English, there isn't a difference. Most people use them the same way. So when people ask this question, should I use may I, should I use can I, if you use one or the other, you will be understood. There won't be a communication problem. We use them the same way. Most people do. However, however, originally may was used to ask permission. We used may to ask permission originally many, many years ago. That was the preferred word, the specific word to ask for permission for something. Can was used to talk about our abilities, things we're able to do. And of course, we still use can to do this today. So sometimes you may meet people who are very, very like strict about this rule. They still want to use may for permission if you use can. So sometimes, for example, in school, if a student says, can I go to the bathroom? A teacher who is very strict about this rule might say, do you mean may I go to the bathroom? So sometimes people are very strict about this, but I feel that this is decreasing a little bit. You might hear some teachers, uh, some people who are strict about this rule kind of make jokes like that. But in general, as I said, most people do use them in the same way. We use them interchangeably. So uh, we use both to ask permission. Therefore, sentences like these, both of these are acceptable. Can I use your computer? In other words, is it okay if I use your computer? and may I use your computer? So we would use both of these to ask for permission for, from somebody. Can I use your computer in this case doesn't mean like do I have the ability to use your computer? This is asking for permission for something. So technically if you want to be historical about it, yes this one is the most correct, may I use your computer, that's true. However, in American English, may I tends to sound more formal these days. So if you use may with your friends and your family, you might sound too polite. You might like create distance between your friends and your family if you use may for everything. Because may sounds polite, may sounds a bit more formal. This might be different in British English, but in American English, it tends to sound a little more polite. We can also change this from can I or may I to, for example, may we, like may we borrow your car? So you're asking permission for more than one person, yourself and someone else. May we borrow your car? Or can he come to the event? So in this case, you're asking permission for someone else to do something. May we, can he? 
Uh, but so this is kind of a basic overview of the difference between them. But there's one other thing I want to pe like point out or mention. That is word order. This is something I see a lot of mistakes with. The word order problem is a confusion between where to put can or may in the sentence. So let's look at two pairs of examples here. The first pair, the difference here. Let's read them first. He can come to the party. I have a period here or a question here because intonation matters. So first, he can come to the party as a statement or he can come to the party as a question. The other one in this pair is can he come to the party? So first thing to notice, in the first sentence, he is the beginning of the sentence. He can come to the party. In the second sentence, can begins the sentence. Can he come to the party? So what is the difference here? This sentence, as a statement, he can come to the party. It's not a question. He can come to the party is a, like a simple confirmation. We are confirming he can come to the party. It's a statement. There's not a request for permission there. However, if we use this upward question intonation, he can come to the party, you're confirming that. So for example, you heard some information that you're surprised. Oh, he can come to the party, for example. You thought maybe that person couldn't come. So this is either a simple confirmation statement, he can come to the party, or a confirmation question, like did I hear that correctly? He can come to the party? So we're confirming something in this sentence with this grammar. In this sentence, however, can he come to the party? This is a question that is asking permission. Can he come to the party? So please note, when you ask permission, your can or your may, as we'll see later, this should be at the beginning of your sentence. Let's move on, though, to this next pair. I've used may here because may presents kind of a different situation. So this one, as I said, confirmation of attendance. However, may has a different meaning. When we use may in a different word order, we create a different meaning. First, let's read the sentences. He may come to the party. Second, may he come to the party? So you can hear my intonation is different as well. He may come to the party. This is a statement, not a question. He may come to the party. This may be a question you would ask, but it's not so common. May he come to the party is a clear question. What's the difference here? Here, we've used may. So in this use of may, with this grammar, we've made a statement, actually. This is a simple statement, like here. It's a statement, but the meaning here is that this man, he, he might attend. So this use of may is not requesting permission. This is saying something is uncertain. So the man might attend, but it's uncertain. He may come to the party. We don't know yet. He's deciding. In this sentence, however, may he come to the party? This is a polite way to ask permission for someone else to attend. May he come to the party? Probably I would use can he come to the party because it sounds less formal. But this is a polite way to ask permission for someone else to attend a party. So please keep in mind, when you want to make a request for permission, you're asking for permission, you need to include can or may at the beginning of the request. If you put it here after your subject, he can come or he may come, you might create some confusion. So please, please, please make sure your request word, your can or your may, is at the beginning of your sentence. That's a key point. So this is a quick overview, a quick introduction to some differences between may and can and may I and can I for asking for permission. I hope that that was helpful for you. If you have any questions or comments or anything else that you think might be helpful with regard to this lesson, please let us know in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you like this video, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and we'll see you again soon. Bye bye! Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about how to use have to. I'm going to focus on using have to to make negative statements and to make two kinds of questions. So let's get started. 
First, I want to begin with a review point. When we use have to, we talk about our responsibilities. These are the things we must do, tasks we are responsible for. This can be at work, at home, in our social lives, whatever. Have to is used to explain responsibilities. We often use have to for things we do not want to do. So things we have a responsibility to do, but maybe we're not interested in doing that thing. Let's look at some examples. First, I have to go to school. Or, she has to go to work. These are examples of things that are our responsibility to do, but maybe we don't want to do that thing, or we're not interested in doing that thing at a specific time or on a certain day. Then, when we use have to in the negative form, it means we don't have a responsibility to do that thing, or in other words, don't have to or doesn't have to is used to express a lack of responsibility. Lack of something means no of something, zero of something. No responsibility for something. So we use don't have to or doesn't have to. One important point about using this for the negative, to make a negative statement, we use this for activities that we can reasonably be expected to do. So a mistake that I hear students make a lot is when they're practicing making sentences with the negative form, don't have to and doesn't have to, they'll try to make an example sentence using something that yes, they don't have a responsibility to do, however, it's something really strange. A great example is a student, or many students actually, who've said, I don't have to drink alcohol at work. So this is a strange example because, yes, even though, although it's grammatically correct, it's really strange to have a job where you drink alcohol. Maybe if you're a bartender, for example, it's reasonable. But in most jobs, it's not reasonable to drink alcohol at work. So if you say, I don't have to drink alcohol at work, it sounds strange. We use don't have to or doesn't have to to talk about things that we can reasonably expect to do. So let's look at some natural examples of this. First, I don't have to go to work today. For example, I took the day off. This is a reasonable expectation. I don't have to go to work today. It's a holiday, for example. He doesn't have to take out the garbage tonight. He doesn't have to take out the garbage tonight. This is a task, a household task, that a person can reasonably be expected not to have to do. Maybe this one night in particular. Maybe um, his sister is going to do it or someone else is going to take care of this. So he doesn't have to do this activity tonight. Another one, you don't have to pay me back. This is a very common expression we use among friends. So you pay for someone's coffee or you pay for someone's lunch or a small item and the friend says, you don't have to pay me back. So I'll pay, you don't have to pay me back. So it's reasonable to expect repayment, but if you say this, you don't have to pay me back, it sounds quite natural. There's no responsibility to pay me back, in other words. So please make sure when you make the negative with this grammar point that you use it for reasonable expectations only. It sounds kind of strange if you use it for something like a little bit crazy or a little bit strange. Okay, with that, then let's move on to the first of the two types of questions I want to talk about. The first question pattern I want to mention is an information pattern. So you're looking to get some kind of information. By this, I mean we use a WH question, like who, what, where, when, why, or how, to begin our question. We follow that with do or does, your subject, have or has, depending on your subject, and to plus some verb or verb phrase. 
So, we use this kind of question to ask about someone's responsibilities. Let's look at some examples. First one, what do you have to do today? This is a question about the other person's responsibilities on this day only. What do you have to do today? I have to go to work. I have to go to the post office. I have to pick up my son from school, for example. Those are the person's responsibilities for that day. What do you have to do today? You're looking for information. Let's look at the next example. Where does he have to go? Where does he have to go is a question about a location. So in this case, where does he have to go? You're asking the question for another person. Maybe there's a student in a school looking for a place or looking for something, some kind of information or looking for a person. I might say to someone else, well, where does he have to go? Maybe, where does he have to go to find this information? Where does he have to go to get this document, for example? So, we're looking for information for this other person. In this case, where does he have to go? I'm talking to a third person in this situation. One more example sentence. Who do we need to meet? Who do we need to meet? So again, in this case, there are probably three people in the situation. There's the speaker. And then we know there's another person here, at least one more person, because we've used we in the sentence. Who do we need to meet? So we're asking this question to someone else. We need to meet with someone about something, but we don't know who is the person. Who do we need to meet? Okay, so when you ask with this kind of pattern, you're looking for some extra, some, something that you're looking for. There's some kind of information you need to get. So, you can use a pattern like this to get that. Let's move on, though, to the second question pattern that I want to talk about today. That is questions for confirmation. Confirmation means like check, how to check, using a question to check the information that you have, to make sure you are correct or maybe incorrect. Confirmation questions. When we make a confirmation question, the pattern is quite different from the information question pattern we looked at a moment ago. Here, we will begin the question with don't or doesn't, depending on the subject. So, don't or doesn't, plus your subject, plus have to, plus your verb or verb phrase. Let's look at some examples here. First one, don't you have to leave? We'll typically use this kind of intonation pattern. Don't you have to leave? So, it's a question. This question means the speaker thinks the listener has to leave. The speaker thinks it's the listener's responsibility to leave. But perhaps the listener is not leaving, is not making motions like they are planning to leave. So the speaker wants to confirm, don't you have to leave? Like the speaker thinks there's some responsibility here. We'll talk about responses to this in just a moment. Let's look at another example of this confirmation question, though. Second, doesn't he have to finish his homework? Doesn't he have to finish his homework? So perhaps this is a parent talking to another parent, like about the student or about someone's son. Doesn't he have to finish his homework? They're trying to confirm something. So again, the speaker thinks that this person, this he in this situation, has a responsibility to finish his homework. But maybe there's been some kind of change. So the speaker asks this question to another person, maybe another parent or a teacher. Doesn't he have to finish his homework? So again, we're confirming. I think this, but is it correct is another way to understand this. Let's look at one more example. Don't we have to get up early? Don't we have to get up early? Get up early means get out of bed early, wake up early. So don't we have to get up early? So this might be between like um, a married couple, for example. Like, don't we have to get up early tomorrow, for example? So again, the speaker thinks I have a responsibility or we have a responsibility to wake up early tomorrow. Is that correct? So that's a confirmation question. So let's take a look at some ways that we can answer confirmation questions. Let's look at some sample responses. First, let's go back to this question. Don't you have to leave? 
To respond to this question, we might use something like this. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. So this yes, I do is like a short way to say, yes, I do have to leave. So in other words, yes, <laughs> it's a yes response. To make a full answer, yes, I do have to leave. But most of the time we just say yes or yes, I do. If, however, the answer is no, we can say no, I don't have to, in this case, leave yet. So you might use something like yet or already, as we see here. But no, I don't have to leave yet. This yet shows the speaker is going to leave, has to leave, but not quite. So not quite, it's not quite the time to leave, in other words. So yes, I do or no, I don't. These two are kind of like the basic uh, yes or no responses, and we can add some extra information at the end. Let's move on to the second sentence. Doesn't he have to finish his homework? So to respond to this question, we could say, yes, he does. Similar here, yes, I do, but because the subject is he, yes, he does. In a no response, we could say, for example, he finished it already. He finished it already. So I mentioned we could use already or yet to talk about the status of an activity. He finished it already. So that means no, he doesn't have to, like in the future, because he finished it already. So the action is done, it's completed, it's finished. So this is a sample answer. Okay, let's move on to one more. Don't we have to get up early? We could answer this with, yes, we do, or simply, no, we don't. So if you are ever not sure uh, of the best way to answer one of these confirmation questions, you can just say yes or no, and you can follow it with like a repetition of the thing that was in the question. So I showed you this here, like yes, I do have to leave. You can use the same thing that you heard in the question to answer that. We see that down here. Don't we have to get up early? Yes, we do have to get up early. Of course, if the answer is no, just use the negative and the same pattern. Like, no, I don't have to leave. No, we don't have to get up early. So to tell the difference between these confirmation questions and these information questions, you can focus on the beginning of the sentence. Is there this WH style question at the beginning of the sentence? Or do you hear a don't or a doesn't at the beginning of the sentence? This is a pretty good hint that I hope can help you tell the difference between these two. So I hope that this helps you in making negative statements and questions with have to. Of course, if you have any questions or comments or want to practice making sentences, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Of course, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye. The basic definition of the verb start is to begin or to initiate something. Examples. Let's start dinner. I started a new project this year. Now let's look at the conjugations for this verb. Present. Start. Starts. Past. Started. Past participle. Started. Progressive. Starting. Now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning is to move suddenly, to move suddenly, like with surprise or shock. Examples. She started when the phone rang. The dog starts every time he hears fireworks. So to start is like to jump. It's like this quick motion of surprise or shock, usually because something like loud happened or something surprising happened. In the first example sentence, a phone rang and it maybe it surprised the person. So she started when the phone rang. It means she like kind of jumped. She made this motion like she was scared or surprised. In the second example sentence, it's fireworks. The dog is afraid of the fireworks. So the dog starts every time he hears fireworks. So the dog jumps, makes this motion every time he hears fireworks. The second additional meaning is to cause to operate, to cause to operate. For example, go start the car. I'm starting my computer now. 
So you can see that we use this like with machines, computers, cars, airplanes, buses, these sorts of things that require operation. So to begin that operation, to initiate that operation, we use the verb start. Go start the car、It、means like begin the operations of the car, kind of. Or I'm starting my computer now means like the computer is coming on, the power is on, like it's beginning all of its operating processes. So to cause to operate is another meaning of start. The third meaning is to begin something with a person or thing. This means like an activity of some kind. Let's look at some examples. Let's start the meeting with sales. I want to start the conference with our keynote speaker. So here we see, let's start the meeting with sales in the first example sentence. That means let's begin the meeting by talking about sales, or it could mean let's begin the meeting with a report from the sales department. So it kind of depends on the situation specifically. But in either case, it means that the topic in some way is going to be about sales. So let's start the meeting with that thing, with that topic. In the second example sentence, it's a specific person. So let's start the conference with the keynote speaker. Means the keynote speaker will be the person who begins the first activity in the conference is the keynote speaker. We are beginning the conference with that keynote speaker's speech, presumably. So, third meaning. Okay. The fourth meaning of this verb is to indicate the initial point for a range or a course or something similar. Examples. Plans start from five dollars per month. The race starts here. So in both of these examples, we see the beginning point. That's shown with the verb start. So plans start from five dollars a month shows that five dollars a month is the cheapest plan. They start at this price. In the second example sentence, the race starts here. This refers to the point where the race begins. From here. The people will race, so it only refers to the starting point, the beginning point, the initial location. Let's move on to some variations for this verb now. The first variation is to start something or to start anything. This means to make trouble. To make trouble. Examples: Are you trying to start something? Keep your mouth shut and don't start anything. So both of these mean making trouble. In the first example sentence, it's a question: Are you trying to start something? Means: Are you trying to cause trouble? Are you trying to make trouble? Are you trying to start a fight? In the second example sentence, it's a command: Like keep your mouth shut and don't start anything. So don't start trouble. Don't make a scene. Don't cause a fuss. So make trouble is start something or start anything. Okay. The second variation is to start over. To start over means to begin again. Examples: I lost the file and had to start over. She started over in a new city. So these just mean to begin again from zero. So in the first example sentence, maybe all of us have had this experience: you delete a file, or there's some mistake with the file, it disappears, and you have to start over. You have to begin again from zero. In the second example sentence, it's about starting over in a new city. So in other words, beginning a new life in a new city. We use start over to refer to that experience. Okay, so I hope that you got some new ways to use the verb. Start from this video. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to try to make an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Hey everyone, welcome to the monthly review, the monthly show on language learning, where you discover new learning strategies, motivational tips, study tools, and resources. By the way, all the lessons and bonuses you're about to see can be downloaded for free on our website. So click the link in the description right now to sign up for your free lifetime account. Okay, today's topic is how to match your routine to language learning. If you're having a hard time sticking with language learning, then this episode is for you. You'll learn one, how to map your routine and set your schedule; two, how to choose the learning medium that's right for you; and three, the language tools you'll want for your learning style. If you're having a hard time sticking with language learning, you'll find out how to fix it now. Let's jump into the first part. One, how to map your routine and set your schedule. First, here's a quick question for you: Which of these would you rather have? A, the world's most comprehensive language learning resources, but a weak study routine, or B, a strong study routine and average resources. Leave your answer in the comments.
But there is a correct answer here. You want a strong study routine. Why? You can have the best app or textbook in the world, but if you don't use it because you don't have a learning routine or a habit, you won't learn anything. If you have a strong routine and work ethic and just a dictionary and internet access, you'll learn more than someone with the best program and no routine. The point is, we are creatures of routines and habits, and our habits can be used for good or bad. They make us or break us. For example, if you have a bad habit, like going to bed at 4 a.m., you'll always feel tired when you wake up for work or school in the morning. If you have a good habit, like exercising regularly, you'll have energy and good health. Once we have a routine, we tend to stick to it. If it's a bad routine, it can do a lot of damage. But if it's a good routine, it can help us enjoy incredible results. We can also use routines to our advantage by applying them to work toward our goals, like language learning. How do you create a strong language learning routine? Here's one way to do it. First, write down your current daily schedule. For example, 7 a.m. I wake up, 8 a.m. I leave the house, 8.20 to 8.50, I'm on the train. 9, 10 a.m. I arrive at work. 1 p.m. I go to lunch, and so on. Write out your daily schedule for the whole week. Make it detailed. If you write out your schedule, you can see your existing daily routine. You can see where you can fit language learning into your existing routine, the routine that you're used to, instead of trying to create a new routine. Why does this matter? For example, some people will look at their schedule and see that they wake up at 8 a.m. They think that if they wake up at 7 a.m., they can have an extra hour for language learning. But for many of us, that approach usually doesn't work because it's not something we're used to. You're trying to wake up early so you can learn a language. You're trying to implement two brand new routines that you're not used to. For many people, this results in failure. Even if you do wake up at 7 a.m., will you get out of bed immediately and jump straight to learning every day? Or will you lose motivation after a few days because you miss that hour of sleep? So map out your weekly schedule. Once you understand where your time goes, find an existing part of your routine that you can fit language learning into. For example, if you take the train in the morning, you can use that existing routine and learn some language during that time. If you always eat lunch at 1 p.m., watch a video lesson during your break. If you always cook at 8 p.m., play some audio lessons in the background. If at first you have to start with multitasking, it's better than nothing. You can at least get used to being exposed to the language while you work on dedicating more time and attention to it. Now, let's jump into part two. Two, how to choose the learning medium that's right for you. Before you begin learning, it's important to understand what kind of learner you are. Are you a visual learner or do you learn by reading? There's something called the VARC model and it's an acronym for four learning styles, visual, auditory or listening, reading, writing, and kinesthetic, meaning hands-on or actual practice and trial and error. You need to understand what kind of learning resources are best for you. So how do you determine what kind of learner you are? This depends on you. Do you like watching videos, listening, reading, or writing? Or do you prefer more hands-on practice? There's no wrong answer. It depends on what kind of learner you are and what you like. Also, think about your past language study experience. Did you remember vocabulary words better when you read them from a book? Or was listening to a podcast more helpful for you? How do you usually remember information best? This helps you choose the learning medium or study tools that are right for you. We'll talk more about this in a few minutes. For now, determine what kind of learner you are. Leave us a comment and let us know. The last thing you need to keep in mind is your study ratio. Your study ratio is how much time you spend absorbing information, input, and how much time you spend producing language, output. What you want to strive for is about 50% input and 50% practice or production, producing that language. So, if you read for 30 minutes, then you want to practice for 30 minutes. You can't just consume, you must practice. Otherwise, it's not going to stick as fast. All right, we've covered routines and learning types. Let's move on to part three. Three, the language tools you'll want for your learning style. In this last part, we're going to cover all the resources that you can take advantage of based on your learning style. But remember, if you're a visual learner, that doesn't mean you should shun resources that don't fit that style. Sometimes it's not practical to watch a video. For example, if you're driving, audio is a much better choice. So let's jump in. If you're a visual learner, take advantage of our video lessons in the lesson library. We have them across all levels, from absolute beginner to advanced. These will be your main source of learning. 
Use the vocab slideshows. You'll find these on every lesson page and vocab list. The slideshows make it super easy to learn and review words. Just press play and watch. You can put it on a loop and watch for as long as you want. Next, if you're an auditory learner, then take advantage of our audio lessons. You can also use dialogue audio tracks. These give you just the conversation from that lesson. And you can use these tracks to immerse yourself in conversations. Next, if you prefer reading and writing, we include lesson notes and transcripts for every audio and video lesson. So, if you're taking a lesson, read along. The lesson notes include extra grammar explanations, vocab lists, and cultural insights that are not available in the lesson. You can also check out our extensive reading books in the lesson library. These are simple one line per page books that will build you into a confident reader. If you prefer writing, you can copy out the lesson dialogue into your notebook. You can leave comments on our lessons with sample sentences. You can keep a daily journal in your target language. Plus, you can send messages to your Premium Plus teacher and practice writing. They'll correct your mistakes, tell you how to express yourself in a natural way, and help you improve fast. And finally, if you're a kinesthetic learner and prefer hands-on experience and trial and error, definitely use our Premium Plus teachers and practice with them. You can do that via the My Teacher Messenger on the site or in the app. Use our spaced repetition flashcards. These cards quiz you on words and phrases and help you master them fast. They sort the words for you and quiz you accordingly. So if you don't know a word, you'll keep seeing it over and over until you get it right. And if you do know it, you'll see it again in a few days. It'll pop up every now and then just to refresh your memory. Also, take advantage of our lesson quizzes. You'll find these in every audio lesson and these test you on the words and phrases you learned in the lesson. You can also practice speaking with our voice recorder. You'll find this inside the dialogue tool. You can record yourself and compare with native speakers. You can keep practicing until you can say the lesson dialogue at a native level. There are tools for every learning style. So, today you learned, one, how to map your routine and set your schedule, two, how to choose the learning medium that's right for you, and three, the language tools you'll want for your learning style. So thank you for watching this episode of Monthly Review. Next time, we'll talk about the secret to speaking more of your target language. If you enjoyed these tips, hit the like button, share the video with anyone who's trying to learn a language, and subscribe to our channel. We release new videos every week. And if you're ready to finally learn language the fast, fun, and easy way, and start speaking from your very first lesson, get our complete learning program. Sign up for your free lifetime account right now. Click the link in the description. See you next time. Bye. Starting easy with language learning is sometimes the best way to get into a new language. But before you feel guilty about wanting to learn the easy way, don't worry. It's fine to start the easy way. You wouldn't expect to lift 200 pounds on your first day at the gym, right? And language is no different. Start easy so you can build up to tackling greater challenges later. In this video, we'll explore seven easy ways to learn a language. The reason it's okay to start easy is the same as the reason you should start easy in the gym. You just can't expect to lift 200 pounds on day one. You start with five pounds, then you move up to 10, 15, 20. And language is the same way. Learn a few phrases today, a basic conversation tomorrow. In a few weeks, you'll be able to speak for up to three minutes in your target language. Then you'll reach five, then 10, then 20 minutes. Success comes step by step, little by little. So it's important to make things that are easy to do and easy to continue part of your routine. If you try to study for two hours a day with nothing but a big textbook, you may overwhelm yourself, get discouraged and get tired. You might not stick with it because it's too hard to do. Things that are easy to do are easy to continue. So here are some resources to help you learn language the easy way. Number one, take audio and video lessons. Listening to audio and watching video lessons is an easy way to consume language. Most of our lessons are five minutes on average, so you don't have to spend too much time at the computer. You can even learn on our app while you're commuting, working around the house, or out on a walk. Number two, take lessons with Alexa. If you own an Amazon Echo, Dot, or Show, or are planning to get one, you'll want to make sure to download some apps to help you learn your target language. Take a look through the Amazon Skill Store. You can listen to lessons and other audio materials actively or passively, whenever the time is right for you. Number three, download the lesson dialogues and immerse yourself. 
With every audio lesson, you get a dialogue track, just the lesson conversation. These are just five to 20 seconds long. When you finish a lesson, download the track. Make a playlist of all of them. Then play them and immerse yourself in the language. Number four, the word of the day. This will take you a minute or less. Sign up for our free word of the day email lessons. It'll be a small boost to your vocabulary every day. Number five, vocab slideshows. You can access vocabulary slideshows on any audio lesson or vocab list. Just press play and watch the slideshow. That's it. This is a fast and easy way to review words from a lesson. You can even put the slideshow on loop to review as much as you want. Number six, the Daily Dose of Language app. This app is for the iPhone, iPad, and Android. With this bonus app, you'll get daily mini lessons covering phrases, grammar, culture, holidays, slang, and more. Every day is something new. Plus, these lessons will take you just a minute or two to complete. Number seven, print out our lessons as physical study material. You might be wondering why you should bother to print anything if all the lesson content is already online. But if you have the material sitting right in front of you, it's a lot easier to just glance through and start learning. With our Word Bank study tool, you can create your own word and phrase lists and print them out. Reviewing takes just a few minutes. You can also print out the lesson notes that come with every audio and video lesson. You'll also find our extensive reading books, which will help you to read faster. You'll find these in the lesson library. What's your reason for learning a language? Is it a personal goal, a hobby, or do you have dreams of living in a country where it's spoken? In this video, you'll discover 10 reasons people learn languages. You'll also learn why knowing and sharing your reason is important to succeeding in your learning. What's your reason for learning a language? Whatever your reason is, whether big or small, knowing it and talking about it is important. More often than not, your reason for learning a language is directly related to your long-term goal for the language. Your reason for learning might be, I want to live in the country where the language is spoken, or I want to understand the culture, movies, and music. But it can also be something simple, like I'm just interested in it. The point is, if you know your reason, you'll always remember what got you started in the first place. As a result, you'll maintain your motivation and continue your studies. But what about sharing your reason with others? This doesn't mean bragging about your goals and saying things like, I'll be fluent in 10 months. Rather, I'm learning because, and sharing something specific to you, real reasons. When you talk about your reason for learning with others, you remind yourself indirectly. And the more you think about it, the more likely you are to do it. Plus, you set an expectation. By sharing your goals and your reasons for learning, your friends see you as someone who's actively learning a language, and that's another powerful motivator. Also, talking about it gives you confidence, the knowledge that you can and will learn the language. A lot of people think they can't learn a language. They think they don't have the time for it or the talent for it. In reality, you just need to start. By sharing your reason, you can convince yourself that you can do it. So, what's your reason for learning? Leave a comment and tell us why you started learning a new language. So, why are other language learners studying? We asked. Here are the top 10 reasons for learning a language. Number one, I love the culture and the people who speak the language. This is a popular answer, especially among our learners studying Japanese and Korean. Number two, I want to understand songs, movies, and TV shows. Songs, movies, and TV shows are great ways to immerse yourself in the language. If you're spending your time learning and immersing yourself, you're going to learn faster. Number three, it's a beautiful language. Sometimes people simply love the way the language sounds. This is a simple answer, but even this can keep you motivated if your interest in the language is genuine. Number four, my family comes from a place where the language is spoken. Of course, people want to be able to connect to their family and the people they love. Speaking of, number five, I want to speak to my partner's family in their language. This can be a great way to connect with people and learn more about them, especially if they're new family. Number six, I'm learning the language to impress someone. Maybe you want to show off to someone special, or maybe surprise a grandparent with a card in their native language. There are a variety of situations in which using another language can show someone you care. Number seven, I love traveling. Knowing the local language when you travel will help you find new places and make new connections. It can only make your travel experience better. Number eight, 
I live or want to live in a country that speaks the language. It's a lot of people's dream to live overseas and experience the culture they love. Or maybe they need to move for work or family reasons. Learning the local language is extremely important if you're going to live in a different country. Number nine, I just love learning languages. What's great about this is if you've learned one language, it's easier to learn another because you learn how to learn a language, right? If you learn one, you develop certain habits and approaches that work for you. You can use this to master another. Number 10, it's just a personal goal. We hear this a lot, especially from learners that stopped, took a break, and came back. If you have a goal in mind, something you wanted to do but never did, you want to come back to it and get it done. Our results show that most people learn for love, for family, to travel, or for self-improvement. So why are you learning? Leave us a comment right now and let us know. Did you have a language teacher that inspired you? Maybe it wasn't a teacher, but a partner or another person, someone that motivated you to learn. You wanted to reward their investment in you by doing well. When learning a new language, having encouragement and the help of a good teacher can be hugely important to succeeding in your studies. In this video, we'll look at the power of a good teacher. Teachers can have a powerful impact on you, so let's look at how great teachers help you during your language learning journey. Number one, a good teacher can push you to improve your speaking. Working on building your conversation skills can be tough. Whether you're practicing a one minute conversation or a 10 minute conversation, having a good teacher to practice with is key. You can prepare for your conversations by creating an outline of things to cover on paper. Then as you talk, you can follow along with the topics you've prepared. These topics can include basic things like greetings, asking about the other person, or just catching up. Because all of the things you're going to talk about have been prepared before you begin the conversation, you can move down the list and practice different stages of conversation. Something as simple as greeting someone and catching up with them can be two to three minutes of talking. Having a good teacher to help you make this outline and go through it with you can really improve your speaking. A good teacher will also be able to handle going off script too. When a conversation goes outside the originally planned outline, a good teacher can react smoothly and keep the conversation going. If you want to make a joke or change the subject, the teacher can follow along. They can react and continue the conversation with you easily. If a teacher shuts down a student when they're trying something new, it can really hurt the student's motivation and enthusiasm. But the right teacher can motivate you to get better, even if your speaking isn't always perfect. The key is finding someone who can take a student's new skills and encourage them, even if they're not correct 100% of the time. Number two, how you can learn faster with outside help. After studying on your own for some time, introducing outside support can be a game changer for your long-term motivation. It can push you to reach new limits and work harder than ever. It can be a teacher, a tutor, a family member, a friend, or someone you look up to. But it has to be someone that inspires and energizes you. Of course, finding people like this is easier said than done. So you might want to take a few trial lessons with a few teachers to find the one you're the best fit with. If you're a Premium Plus user, take advantage of your Premium Plus teachers. They will hold you accountable, send you assignments, and give you feedback to help you perfect your language skills. It's also important to find a teacher whose lessons you enjoy. Sometimes people stick with lessons just because they like the instructor. There are so many types of teachers. If you can find instructors you gravitate towards, you may find you'll want to learn more just because of who they are. Make sure to check out our lesson library. There are a ton of classes and teachers to choose from in the absolute beginner, beginner, and intermediate levels. If you hear someone you like, you'll be more likely to stick with their lessons, and you'll learn better. Great work. Here's a reward. Speed up your language learning with our PDF lessons. Get all of our best PDF cheat sheets and eBooks for free. Just click the link in the description.